The presenter of our main talk today is a uh, regular participant member of the Oasis community for over a year. And uh, I'm going to read from her introduction that she wrote. Although for the first six months you probably didn't notice her when she was leaving the room during the meet and greet time and generally hiding in the back corner. But she is hiding no longer. Um, <laughs> certainly not after today. Um, Michelle is a stay-at-home mom with two beautiful boys, Isaac and Trent, age two and four. Um, uh, she grew up in Australia, completed her studies at the University of Melbourne in the areas of chemical engineering and science. In 2010, she came to Houston with her former husband to pursue his career in the oil and gas industry, and she has since chosen to remain here to raise the boys. In late 2010, at age of 30, Michelle was formally diagnosed as a woman with Asperger's syndrome. Two years later, her oldest son was also diagnosed with Asperger's at the age of three. And in Michelle's words, she says she's always been described by her friends as a bit quirky or eccentric and often amusing, intentionally or unintentionally. <laughs> her interests include making Excel spreadsheets to analyze everything in her life, <laughs> enjoying nature, observing, discussing human behavior, algebra, statistics, watching bugs, scheduling, planning, anything, biology, psychology, daydreaming, looking at cute baby clothes, singing and dancing, and advocating acceptance, kindness, and a world where everyone appreciates and supports each other regardless of how unique each one of us is. And eating chocolate. Okay. <laughs> so um, let's welcome our friend Michelle Vines to talk to us. I'll try to testing. Um, hi, as introduced, I'm Michelle, and as you can see from my badge that I left at home, I believe. <laughs> um, yeah, you'll have to excuse me, I'm a bit nervous here. I'm not a speaker at all, and I might lose my words sometimes, because that's what I do. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, you're all in your underwear, so it's, it's all good. <laughs> okay, uh, you might dim the lights so I can make slides appear, like magic. Like oh God, this is scary. Well, not God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I decided that I'd shove myself up on stage and do this talk. It's sort of something I was quite brave to do, to come and talk about something personal. And I thought about doing this for quite a while. God, I'm shaking. But um, what triggered me to think about it was on last April, I don't know if many of you are aware, it was Autism Awareness Month, and I was sitting on Facebook, you know, because I love Facebook, <laughs> you know, too, too much, but um, I saw all these posts flying around, autism awareness, light up blue for autism, puzzle pieces, autism, be aware of autism, and I became very aware of the word autism. Um, and I saw there's a lot of information out there on sort of the classical autism and sort of people who are very affected, parents struggling with children who are sort of low functioning and will need help all their life. And I sort of thought, I don't see that much on the really high functioning end. There's not much understanding of that. Um, there, there is some, there's some good stuff out there, but I just decided I'd talk about it some more. And this is sort of me repeating myself, but a lot of people are aware of the stereotypes of Asperger's, like, you know, Sheldon Cooper, and I've heard of Rain Man and Train Spotting. I, don't, I haven't seen those movies, so I don't know how accurate they are. Um, yeah, well, Sheldon's awesome, so he's a good stereotype. <laughs> These people are sort of extremes. These are, like, you take Asperger's and you exaggerate and you give them every single trait you could have. And in reality, I've met a lot of people with Asperger's, and there's a lot in the crowd today, and there are quite a few of us that are high-functioning, quite good at compensating for the traits and fitting them well, and you might not even notice that we have Asperger's. It's, a, a, you know, there's a big subgroup of people that seem pretty normal, a bit quirky, a bit strange, make some funny jokes, you know, or weird jokes, but... <laughs> You know, you wouldn't pick it, you'd just say, oh yeah, that guy's a bit funny or weird or quirky, but we're, we're cool, we fit in. And I, that's what I wanted to talk to today, talk about today, <laughs> that demographic, because 
Yeah, this isn't going to be a talk about everyone with Asperger's. There's all sorts of traits, there's all sorts of different experiences with it. I just wanted to talk specifically about that end of the spectrum and what that actually means because, yeah, we, we look and seem normal, so what does it mean? Um, so the first obvious question that comes to mind, what is Asperger's syndrome? And when I first found out about this, I got really curious and like the Aspie that I am, I read about it and I read about it some more and I looked it up online and I read, you know, the, the, you get lots of statements, you know, of things like we're socially awkward, we have difficulty forming friendships, obsessive, obsessive interests and behaviours, lack of eye contact, hypersensitivity and difficulty seeing others' perspectives. You see all these lists of traits that an Aspie might have, but I read some more and I read things on forums and that was more, more helpful, seeing what people with Asperger's actually said. And um, then I started hearing about brain wiring and I started, you know, the Aspie and me went, oh, I gotta read more about that. So I went and read studies, the studies on brain scans, the differences, you know, all these things they've done with people with autism, Asperger's, blah, blah, blah. I read and I read and I read and I, you know, <laughs> I did what I do. And um, basically now when people ask me what it is, it's really simple, it comes down to this. Um, in when you have autism or Asperger's, as you grow up, your brain just basically grows to be wired in a different way. And you know how you have male brains and female brains, there's lots of things showing that they have different connective tissue and processing tissue and stuff. So the Aspie brain is just like another sort of brain. And you've got these all these um, discussions of what it is, but that's, it's simple, that's what it comes down to. Um, I have this chart here and I have a limited time slot so I'm not going to read through this and start talking technical but I just wanted to show you what it is. When I first started researching Asperger's I um, was reading all these brain scan stuff and I put together a chart, male brain, female brain, autistic brain and then all these differences that were being found. And, yeah, I'd love to talk more about this, but no time. So, um, but I will get give Bart these slides and he, I'll get him to insert it in the video if he can so that people who are interested can read more. And um, yeah, I could even summarize, but I'll, I'll just point out this one bit that's sort of interesting. I was reading, like this isn't the key difference, but one thing I particularly personally found interesting is there's this frontal lobe, which is the rational critical thinking part of your brain. And I was finding studies that saying, you know, in Asperger's, increased um, connectivity, increased volume, increased concentration as metabolites, this frontal lobe is more active. Um, in regular people, the, there's this amygdala emotional processing center where you uh, can bypass the frontal lobe and have an instant emotional reactions. Like, historically, if you were being chased by a lion, you want to run, you want to react before you stop and think, hmm, a lion's chasing me, what should I do about this? What would be the best strategy? Because you would get it. <laughs> so, so, yeah, that's something we've needed in the past and I've noticed just that Aspies seem to be moving, or not everyone, but there's a trend for people on the spectrum to be more into logical thinking and being able to process things rationally even in times of extreme emotion, which I think is pretty cool. Um, Anyway, I'll move on. I wasn't going to talk about that, and I did. <laughs> There's a million references to go at the table. Um, so, yeah, my summary, what I wanted you to get out of that is that Asperger's isn't just a list of symptoms and bad behaviours. It is a neurological difference. Um, next. Uh, yeah, one element I wanted to touch on is there's a lot of lists of problems people with Asperger's might have. Um, because, you know, you write diagnostic manuals. If you're a psychologist, you want to think about how you can help people, what troubles they might have. But that there is information on it, but less in the diagnostic information and less available is information on the positives as well. There's actually a lot of positives that come with this difference as well as negatives. And, yeah, that, that's not going to be written in the textbooks so much. It's not of importance. You know, they don't write a diagnostic you know, uh, write up for people with extra creativity or high IQ, they don't need the help, so. Um, so, Aspie gifts, um, some uh, common things that Aspies can be talented in, I've got a list here, is higher than average IQ, uh, strong logical and rational thinking, I meant, 
hyper-focus and obsessive interest. We get interested in something and we just have to read everything and do everything and learn and learn. But that can lead us to become experts in our fields and some people can make new discoveries and be inventors and, you know, make leaps in science and stuff because of that. Um, strong attention to detail and many Aspies have been known to be talented in the arts as well. Um, oh, whoops, wrong button. So here's a list of famous people who either are known to be on the autism spectrum or are speculated to have been. Like Albert Einstein, Bill Gates, Isaac Newton. A lot of these are scientists, uh, politicians, artists, writers. These are pretty significant people. Um, and I wanted to read out a few quotes. Uh, the first two are from Tony Atwood, who is well known in the autism community, sort of a world expert on it. Um, one, most of the major advances in science and art have been made by people with Asperger's, from Mozart to Einstein. That's a big statement, most, not even some, but, you know, that, that means people with this brain type are really predisposed to be able to do great things. Now, not everyone will, just like, you know, not everyone in real life will do wonderful things, but that, that's a pretty positive statement. Um, Asperger's has probably been an important and valuable characteristic of our species throughout evolution. So, yeah, what I just said. And the second one is by Hans Asperger's, who is a German scientist who first wrote about Asperger's um, in the 1940s. And he said, for success in science and art, a dash of autism is essential. And that's sort of that perfectionism, attention to detail, you know, hyper-focus trait that we have. So this isn't like something, you, you see people wanting to find cures for autism, rule it out, you know, all, all this stuff. This isn't necessarily something we want to get rid of in society. It, it's a useful thing to be going on beside regular people, you know, in terms of human advancement, I think. Mm -hmm. um, next. So I thought I'd tell my story. Um, what was I going to say? Lost it. I told you I'd lose my words. Um, yeah, well, I grew up, I was normal. Like, well, I thought I was normal. A few people around me thought I was a bit strange. But, you know, when I was young, I was too oblivious to care. So I went about doing my thing, lining up my dolls, ignoring the rest of the people. They could play if they do it my way. But if you want to make the dolls talk and walk around, go away. That's not how it works. So, you know, I was normal. <laughs> And um, I had no idea I had Asperger's. As I got older, I got more aware that I was sort of socially not getting along with people as well. And the more I realised, oh, I do this, I do that, that's not going down well, the more I sort of changed my behaviour and learnt to sort of play by neurotypical rules. And, you know, I became more and more normal. Um, but I, I didn't think there was anything particularly wrong with me, you know. So when I was 28, a um, friend of mine from high school who'd actually grown up to become a psychologist, she, I was talking to her about people, relationships, you know, deep stuff, and um, she suggested to me maybe I have Asperger's syndrome. And you know, I remember she sort of was doing weird things, like she took a cup at me and said, this is a dinosaur, rawr! And I went, okay, that's a dinosaur. <laughs> I guess she was supposed to test if I take things logically, but I'm old enough to know not to be phased by a cup being a dinosaur, but anyway, um, yeah, so I thought, oh cool, this is interesting, I went home and I read about it, and at first I read some symptoms and went, no, nah, no, nah, this sounds, you know, really disabled, this sounds abnormal, I'm normal, I'm smart, you know, I'm not, yeah, I'm, I'm not bragging, or anything. <laughs> I'm smart, I'm not someone lesser or, you know, I don't want to say retarded, that's not a nice term, but you know, I just sort of read it and went, nah, no, not me, I'm, I'm too good. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, but anyway, I forgot about it, I put it aside. A year or so later, I was watching something on television, it was actually OCD House, to admit, and a guy on there got diagnosed with Asperger's by the, during the course of the show. And if anything, he was weird, he had satanic delusions and all this stuff, and I should have gone, whoa, I am not like that guy, I, I don't have Asperger's, I'm not. Yeah, but actually, 
the show made me think because I saw the way he was dealing with the cognitive, behavioural, emotional stuff and he was sort of logic and logicking it away and it wasn't working on him so I I was just watching it and thought his mind process is a bit like mine and I, I don't know, it just prompted me to think a bit and then I went online and started reading it again and this time instead of just reading the formal stuff I found some forums and yeah basically the first time what I read is stuff like this you know lack of social social or emotional reciprocity well if I had that would I know it's like no um, <laughs> appear not to understand and empathize or be sensitive with others feelings well I care a lot about people I have a lot of empathy so it's like no I don't appear you know again would I know um, there was one engaging in one-sided, long-winded conversations without noticing if the listener is listening or trying to change the subject. Okay, a bit guilty. <laughs> but most of the rest of this, I just sort of went, no, no, I don't think I... But then when I read the forums, what people with Asperger's were actually saying really did relate to me. I hate having to go to big social functions. I like small groups. I never know when to cut into the conversation. Other people don't seem to like deep conversation. I'm not so interested in the small talk. Once people really get to know me, they just lose interest in hanging out with me for no obvious reason. I'm tired of having to work so hard to do and say the right thing all the time. People get offended for no reason. I don't even know what upset them. Other people can be really frustrating to work with, you know, technically incompetent. Or, like, it can just seem that way when you've got a lot of technical focus. Uh, people think I'm mad or frowning when I'm just thinking. And stuff like that. I started going, oh yeah, that sort of is me. Um, so I joined forums and support groups and um, suddenly like, I was looking back at my life with this Aspie brush and going, oh my God, that's what happened. Oh, that's what upset them. Oh, oh, you know, all these light bulb moments. Oh my God, that's, that's what's been going on my whole life. Fancy that, you know. <laughs> so um, but at about age 30, I decided to approach a specialist to be formally tested. Um, someone who's a specialist in diagnosing adults and um, yeah I was diagnosed at age 30 and um, yeah my oldest son was also diagnosed a few years later he sort of I, I saw that coming for a long while he had a few traits of his own and then yeah, that's it so next topic I talked a bit about how over time I've learnt these social skills people sort of got to me don't seem to have Asperger's, you're so normal and I come across normal mostly, you know, maybe not when you put me up on stage and I'm scared of everyone, but, um, you know, so does that mean I'm normal or cured now? That's sort of the question people ask, if you can act normal, if you can fit in and get along with people, does that mean you're not naspy anymore? And um, yeah, actually it is a lot more complicated than that because what you see is a person's surface coping mechanisms, behaviours, learnt behaviours, what goes on under the surface is a bit different. So <laughs> that rock is way too big, I think the boulder should be like this big instead. But, um, <laughs> the, um, I thought, yeah, I don't have time to talk about every Aspie difficulty because that would go forever um, and certainly my experiences are different to everyone else's. If I was a guy, I'd be talking about women, relationships, it's impossible. If I was low functioning or a younger version of myself, I'd be like rejection, isolation, no one wants to be friends with me, what's going on there? That's a huge issue for a lot of people on the spectrum. And you see the internet full of people saying, I'm so isolated, I'm depressed, no one likes me. That's, that's really common. But I decided I'm not going there today because I only had time for a few examples and I want to talk about just a few things that are most relevant to me in my life now, you know, because I'm seeming so normal, so what could I possibly have going on? Um, the first one's an obvious one, overstimulation. It's common for people on the autism spectrum, I don't know why, to have extreme senses and be hypersensitive, touch, taste, sound, light, smell, have one or two of these, or well, I know someone who had all of them. Um, for me, sound and light, um, I'm not so bad with sound, but the light, I, you know, fluorescent lights, daylight outside, something about it just tenses me. I get eye strain, headaches all the time. It's just, 
an unfortunate thing about being me, so I wear sunglasses inside when I'm around people I know. <laughs> look daggy, but I, I'm going to rock that look, so <laughs> make it cool. And um, yeah, it's most obvious when I turn the light off and it's like, oh, I can relax now, I feel better, I'm not tense anymore. Um, I, I included a video here, but I don't, I can't fit this in either. There's a short little video, of, it shows auditory overload, and I thought this little thing was great. So I've included a link to it, and maybe I can share it on the Oasis page or direct it to Bart or whatever so that people can see this in their own time. It was a really cool video. But I will move on. Um, oh yeah, I have a confession to make to everyone. I found out recently that I am a nyctophiliac. And <laughs> that's not as creepy as it sounds. <laughs> but it's the name for someone who loves the darkness or night time and just finds relaxation, comfort. I feel like more myself when it's not bright. Um, yeah, so I'm not creepy, promise. <laughs> um, the second difficulty... Okay, shift of focus multitasking. I put up this brain slide before. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Very helpful. I put up this uh, brain slide before talking about how the brain's different. And one area is that people on the autism spectrum have significantly less connective tissue in the brain. Um, we have more grey matter, which is the process con condition, like the, uh, the computer processor, but less cables connecting all the bits and the hemispheres. So um, when I say shift of focus is a strand, I don't mean, uh, I don't like doing it. I mean, it's actually, it takes a little more effort to get from one thing I'm focusing on to another thing. Those brain connections aren't there. So this is like, it takes me five minutes to jump to something else and then jump back. and. When you talk about multitasking, which people, women especially, do really easily, for me that's like, ah, oh, I don't know, I'm, it's, it causes me headaches, it's stressful, it's frustrating, because I'm just not wired to do that easily. Um, and what people don't realise is many work environments just expect you to multitask all the time. You know, you're working and listening to people talk around you, you're paying attention to what's going on or you miss out what's happening in the workplace and people come and interrupt you and talk to you and I'm thinking, oh, go away, I was focusing on this, can you come back and talk? But I don't say that, I say, hi, thank you, <laughs> hi. <yeah. laughs> and, um, yeah, we're best, Aspies are best suited to just focus on one thing, crunch, grind, do it, and then, and then talk. Um, and yeah, don't get me started on parenting, that one's been a challenge, but I'm making it work. And yeah, I, I care a lot about my kids, so I make sure they become my focus. Um, exhaustion and burnout, this is problem three, it's a bit linked to that last one. Um, people on the autism spectrum, or Asperger's, we don't intuitively read body language. I have to remember to keep looking at people's eyes and because I, I don't tend to do it, I have to think to do it, things like that. Um, we, we, you know, when we're interacting with people and picking up that body language and communication, we're doing it more intellectually than intuitively. So when you're around people for a long time and trying to connect and interact with them, it can get draining, like it's, it's tiring. Um, so social situations are tiring, and the more people that are around, the harder it is to keep up with everything that's going on. It's like this huge intellectual exercise. And having said that, that doesn't mean that we don't want to socialise. In fact, I, I love talking to people. I'm a very social aspie. I want to go out and have fun and do the karaoke that we did the other night. And <laughs> you know, I, I, I love being out. It just means it takes a lot more what we call energy tokens, and we drain a lot easier and need more recovery time. Um, and for me. Yeah, I mentioned multitasking is draining, overstimulation is draining. And for me, for some reason, phone calls are just like, oh, I can only handle one a day. These are the worst thing in the world. Don't ask me to ring and find some information out, please. And well, I mean, at work, I had to do it constantly, but boy, I got drained quickly. And I don't know why the phone call thing, but talking to other people on the spectrum, a lot of people seem to hate the phone calls. You know, I'm happy to talk to people in person, um, yeah, or text, email, away I go, there's not too much work there, but you know, for some reason someone will tell me one day what that is. <laughs> so exhaustion and burnout 
happen a lot and people sort of don't get it. You, you're out, you're, you know, you get to a point where you just, oh, I can't go anymore, I need a break, I need a rest. And that can be like halfway through the day if you're working. But, you know, it's, it's not something that is really well known or understood, but it happens to a lot of people on the spectrum. And I'm not going to read all this, but I just wanted to point this bit out. ASD means autism spectrum and NT means neurotypical, you know, that's all of you with normal brains. Um, no autism spectrum book or neurotypical professional references autistic burnout. Only adults on the spectrum are talking about it online and yet it's something that's happening to all of us but it, it's not a well-known area and it doesn't seem to be the focus of carers, parents, professionals. They don't seem to understand this burnout is a factor in you know, kids' lives or you know, our lives. Um, and here's a bunch of articles from recently. Asperger's syndrome and fatigue, being emotionally exhausted, I'm tired, running on empty with Asperger's. Exhausting, exhausted all the time. It's, it's, it is real, it's something a lot of us experience and typical people don't get it. They're sort of like, why are you saying you're tired? You don't even do as much as I do. Yeah. Um, okay, I don't want to get too down with this. Fourth problem is sort of more of a funny one. Um, strangers, scary strangers. I see a few of them today. <laughs> <laughs> How dare they be here? No, I'm kidding, you're all welcome. Um, unfamiliar people are harder to read because they're less predictable and to a degree I analyse my friends and I predict how they're going to react to things and I work out what I should and shouldn't say and there's, there's a degree of intellectual... It's easier when people are familiar. And many people on the spectrum have had experiences with accidentally offending people. You know, people don't know how to take you when they don't know you and they can't say, oh, that's just Michelle, just assume she didn't mean it how it sounded. I had a friend say that to someone else once, you know, just assume if Michelle said it, it it's not really that bad. <laughs> that was when I was a bit younger. Um, so some people are fine they just keep going about their business and talking and you know some are more confident for others of us on the spectrum it can lead to us being stressed self-conscious with too many strangers around and i personally find too many strangers to be a bit draining and stressful i like familiar faces so i you know i talk to my friends about it scary strangers who let all these people in the mall they should go away <laughs> not really I, I know they have every right to be there. I'm not serious. It's just a feeling of, mm, okay. <laughs> I'm not horrible, I promise. <laughs> um, now, the fifth, this is the last problem I'm going to talk about. Um, this one, there's a few slides on it because this was actually a big one for me. And I, I'm not the only one who's had this sort of experience. Uh, I'll start with a bit of background. Unlike most people on the spectrum, I did really well at school and university. Um, a lot of people don't do so well because we often have a bit of executive dysfunction, difficulty organising ourselves. And, but I organised myself from like late high school. I had a diary I carried everywhere with me that I wrote things in, wrote to-do lists. It's, it's actually under my chair in my bag there. I still <laughs> I could pull it out and say, here's my diary. If you want to do something, I'll just write it down. Um, so I organised myself well. I found systems. I compensated. Um, I also compensated for burnout. I avoided multitasking by basically saying, I'm going to do all my homework at home and when I'm at school, I'm here to socialise. So I'd come in and I'd talk and people would say, shh, Michelle, you know, be quiet. And I'd never know volume control. I'd talk loudly at the wrong time. <laughs> I'm sure I annoyed people, but I got along without stressing myself too much that way. You know, I could do just do one thing at a time. And when I felt sort of burnt out, overstimulated, I'd just go, okay, no more, had enough. And when I was feeling well, I'd proactively do all my work knowing that I might have times like that. So I just came up with all these ways that I did well and managed to fare really well. And I graduated top 5% in my class at a very prestigious university in Melbourne. I uh, was awarded scholarships in high school and I got a, um, summer research scholarship at the University of Queensland, another good university in Melbourne. I, I did really well and so this is someone who was soaring up the academic track, doing really well at university and you know I 
said I'm so modest about being smart and, and I, I, I thought I was going somewhere, I had a lot of potential, I was career focused, I was ambitious, I'm the opposite of a lazy person, like I was driven, I worked really hard. Then, life. Um, I started working and I had no idea at the time, I was just not okay. Um, I hadn't been diagnosed, I had no idea why I was not okay and I couldn't really put my finger on what was going on. I'd just get in there and I'd, I needed to get out of there, I couldn't stand it. And basically what happened was I had all these compensation techniques and I couldn't use them in the work environment, it wasn't suited for that. I was suddenly in this world of social everywhere, cubicles, people, high pressure, be there nine to five. I'll jump ahead a slide. I, you know, I, I sort of figured out what it was many years later, but it's this overstimulation and frustration, light, noise, multitasking, being there nine to five, I can't leave when I'm spent and overstimulated. You know, long periods of socialization, workplace politics, oh God. <laughs> when, when, when you're at school, you're not competing and you know, you're just doing your work, your friends are doing your work, you're encouraging each other. You come into the workplace, there are these promotion games, these people are, yeah, you know what I mean, I just, I was drowning. <laughs> I didn't do that well and I just didn't handle how tired that made me dealing with people who are doing all this say one thing, mean another stuff that people do. Um, and not being able to do things my own way, it's like the boss said, I want you to call six people. I'd be like, no, no, I only call one person a day. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't free to completely change the way I worked and skipping back, you know, I became, this is the down part of the speech, but I, I did become extremely depressed. I'd get home, I couldn't do anything, just lie in bed. I was so burnt out because I'd be burnt out halfway through the day and had to keep going and going and, you know, I couldn't, I didn't have any interests. I didn't, couldn't join the family and do so. All I could do was just yeah, I was just get up, go to work, come home, be depressed and until I had to get up and go again and yeah, I had a horrible time and yeah, I can't play that down. That was just, you know, I dread going to work and I, I had really disturbing daydreams like I'd be on the train going to work and I would daydream that the train would crash and take me to hospital so I wouldn't have to work. You know, that's messed up. <laughs> Another one that's even, you know, more charming. It's like maybe someone had come and bomb the city. But, you know, before all the people came, it's, it's my daydream. I don't want anyone to get hurt. So everyone's still at home in bed, well away from the city, and someone comes and bombs the buildings. And then I, this, this is disturbing, and I knew it was disturbing. But I just, I could not stand to get up and go in one more day. One, and, yeah, so, yeah, I'm not a nutcase, I promise. <laughs> this is something I went through. Um... Okay, and yeah, this I love this poster. Everything's too much, too much, too much, too much. I can't handle it all. But that's something I think a lot of people on the spectrum can relate to. Um, apparently, my story is really common. When I went and got diagnosed and talked to the psychologist who diagnosed me, she said, yeah, I've heard lots of stories like that. Um, and this statistic I just wanted to put in, 80% of people with Asperger's are currently unemployed or underemployed, I think it was. Um, most commonly due to having meltdowns in the workplace or quitting or having meltdowns. Because um, when you get taken to your limit, your emotional limit or your exhaustion limit, a lot of people melt down. They might yell or scream or cry or shake or whatever. That, that's meltdowns that people get fired for. You know, they might, I've heard of people hitting someone or doing you know, meltdowns are the most common thing that happen. And then some of us will shut down, and I was more of a shut down person, just sort of go quiet and try and get through it, but, you know, falling apart inside. And so people like me had quit, people with meltdowns would get fired, and it seems that this is a group of people who have so much potential with that logical brain, with, you know, high IQ, these are people who've done brilliant things, or some of them have done, you know, this is a group that could do so much, and yet 80% of us can't fit in the work environment. You know, so that this is a big deal. Like, if, if we could be accommodated and work in a different way, this is so much wasted potential. Anyway, I'll go on. Um, I had just a few little myths I wanted to address. 
Um, the first is that I see this a bit, Aspies don't have emotions. And the first dot point says it all. Nonsense. Um, Aspies are actually, we can be over-emotional and we have, have trouble with emotional regulation. Like when we get upset about something, it's a lot harder to calm down than it is for a normal person. And that's sort of part of the brain wiring. Um, and we definitely have a lot of emotion. Um, people on the autism spectrum, many of us lack a part of the well, nerves in the brain called mirror neurons. And that's like if you see someone telling a story about how they're upset, you feel how they would feel. If someone puts their hand up, you sort of feel what it'd be like to put, put your hand up or whatever. People with Asperger's don't read body language well. We don't have those mirror neurons. So it can take us a while to perceive what's going on for another person and see a perspective other than our own. So it might look like we don't care. We're not reacting the right way instantly. We, we just act strange. We seem less emotional on the surface but actually it's nothing to do with lack of empathy lack of emotion it's all to do with lack of perception and knowing the right responses um, many aspies i've met including myself and i can see a few people here are very strongly compassionate towards <coughs> others we actually can care a lot and because many of us have been through hardship we can understand feelings of hardship um, yeah, there's a slide. Not only can people with Asperger's syndrome have friends, our loyalty and empathy can make us the best friends to have. Um, two is this, just this idea that it's easy to recognise Asperger's, it stands out. Actually, there's a lot of symptoms that we can have and each of us has different versions of it. So, you know, if you know a person with Asperger's, it doesn't mean you can recognise it in others or that people are easily recognised. Um, and there are a lot of us out there that go unrecognised, like for the same reasons I dismissed it, we seem a bit normal. Um, professionals are trained to recognise the symptoms in children when they're really extreme and obvious, but not everyone's familiar with adults because we, seem, we sort of compensate more, we seem normal, those coping mechanisms can be hard to see through. You know, no one will meet me and go, oh, you've got Asperger's, you're strange. You know? <laughs> I seem sort of normal, I hope. <laughs> I, guess, I guess that's my opinion. Um, and a lot, lot less is known about girls and women on the spectrum because it's traditionally sort of a boy's condition. They made all the diagnostic data based on information about boys um, and all the tests are based on boy or there's sort of a chicken and egg problem now, you know, they want to know more about girls. but. How do you analyse girls when the only girls who are diagnosed are diagnosed with boy criteria? So there's sort of the... Um, yeah, they, it's going to take time to know more about that. And another collage of newspaper articles, girl, uh, TED, a TED talk on girls and autism made me cry. Thousands of girls uh, may have been undiagnosed because they can hide the signs better than boys. Why women with autism are invisible? Um, women and girls on the... Yeah, there's all these articles saying we're missing the girls they're, they're having trouble they're getting picked up because of side symptoms like depression anxiety ocd and you know they're, they're troubled but we're, we're not picking them up um and myth number three this is the last one so i won't go on forever but um there's this notion that if you teach aspies to act you teach them social skills if they act more normally that you know they're approaching cured and if they act well enough they may not need you know the schools might have a assessment and take away their or remove them from programs or whatever because they seem normal now they seem cured um, but of course if someone has Asperger's they will always have the Aspie mind um, and we do learn social skills especially as we grow it might be a bit slower than typical people but we you know especially if we're bright we learn we fit in you know there's a point where it's not obvious anymore for some of us some others you know are more focused on other things and aren't so focused on behavior you, you get a range of people but the point i wanted to make is that the more effort someone on the spectrum is putting into acting normal the more burnout and exhaustion we might be experiencing underneath and you see a lot of uh, parents talking a lot about social skills training, you know, teaching the kids to behave and act normal and all of that. And that's good. People can benefit from that. But you've got to be a little careful to balance it up with not pushing a child too hard because 
they're exhausted. And a common complaint I hear from parents is they just, they're lazy, they just want to play computer games all day, they're unmotivated. And I look at it and I think, that child is overstimulated, overexhausted, they're coming home and they're just trying to survive, like, they're burnt out. So what do young boys do to wind down and take away that stress? A lot of them go play computer games. That's, <laughs> that's not laziness, that's, I'm exhausted, I can't do anymore. And a lot of parents don't understand that. Um, so they just want to put them in more social skills, tell them they're lazy, stop, you know, you just need motivation, get, get behaving. And, and it's actually sort of they need less, they need to have a less draining life, then they can start thinking about growing and doing better. You know, start thinking about anything other than just, oh, I need to wind down, I just want to escape. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't mean to make people sad. I just thought that was an important <laughs> point to make and get out to the world because it's not well understood. Yeah, I'm not crying, I don't have the mirror neurons. <laughs> yeah, so I liked this slide. What is the ultimate square pegs? And the problem with pounding a square peg into a round hole is not that hammering is hard work, it's that you're damaging the peg or destroying. Um, so since, just to sum up, since diagnosis, I, it was a relief to me. I felt excused, like I, for so long in my life I pushed myself to work because that's what I should do, everyone works. I'd talk to people about problems and they'd say, well, no one likes working, we all have to do it. And, you know, it was just this realisation of, oh, it was harder for me than everyone else and I thought that was the case, but now I can just say, okay, I can do what I can cope with. I don't have to push myself to do what everyone else thinks I should do. Um, I look forward to throwing out some of those social skills I've learnt and just being me a bit more because the more you try and be what you should be, the, the more you suppress who you really are. And I, I'm getting to a point in life where I just don't care to be perfect and impress everyone. I, I still do a bit. You know, I, I just want to lean in the direction of I'm me if I'm quirky and silly and whatever else that I am then let other people bend a bit back and just accept me for who I am. Um, yeah, and I'm learning to set boundaries and say no, which is sort of a hard one because people in communities especially, they want you to volunteer, they want you to do things and they expect you should be able to do what everyone else can do and I sort of have to just look at me, knowing me, and say, well, this is how much I can handle, this is how much will just take me to exhaustion and I especially want to avoid that because i got two young kids I go home to and I don't want to be cranky, I want to be able to be warm and loving all day right to the end of the day and not drain myself, so I make it a high priority to just not commit to too much, make, look after myself and make sure I can get through the day, especially for my boys. And I've been doing a good job of that, so, you know, proud of myself. Um, but just to end up, <laughs> yeah, I thought you'd see that now. <laughs> I wanted to tell a story about coming to Houston Oasis. Um, yeah, I actually heard about this place, I think, from John Ronald there first, same as Stephen. Um, the first time I came here, I thought, I, I'd heard about it online, I finally decided to turn up and um, the first meeting I was here, I started crying quietly in the back and um, people, I, I, you know, I had reactions like, oh, you know, it's emotional for a lot of us to come to this place where, you know, finally we can be around people who believe what we believe, we don't have to hide who we are, and that is very true, but um, that's not what I was crying about. <laughs> I just sort of nod and agree. Um, I was actually crying because I came to this place and I saw people who were humanist, kind, warm, they believe the things I do. This is this warm, lovely crowd I recognise very quickly at just how empathetic, friendly and kind this place is. So I was crying because people are nice. No, that's not the end of the story. Um, I, I had experiences where I'd gone into groups like mum's groups and in a big crowd there's a lot of noise, a lot going on. I have trouble sort of coming out of my shell and talking to people. I'm overwhelmed. I, I don't get to know people that way. And I'd been to mum's groups for a year or two where, you know, it's sort of superficial. I never really got to know anybody. I never made any close friends, you know, the people who came to come to my house, play with the kids, stuff like that. 
I'd gone through groups and groups like this and I came here and Mike said, you know, everyone fill your coffee and go talk and make some friends and I got up and and I felt very uncomfortable because I felt all these scary strangers. <laughs> and, um, and someone came up to me and started talking about politics and eh, politics, you know, <laughs> it's not my topic. And, and I just sort of went quiet in my shell. I was very uncomfortable and I think I just, I started feeling sorry for myself. I thought, oh, I'm never going to fit in. If I can't fit in a group like this, where can I fit in? I'm just going to be isolated forever. I just started feeling all these, woe is me, I'm, I'm alone, I'm miserable. And that's why I was really crying. But <laughs> it sounds a bit sad now. But anyway, the good news is I was wrong. I, um, I kept coming, probably for the first six months I just sat up the back. Um, but I've started to go to a few events. Thank you so much to Hillary for creating Family Friendly Happy Hour. That was a place where I could go and be with smaller groups of people so I could talk more personally and get to know people. And um, so slowly I've got to know a lot of faces and now I look at the crowd, I see like half friendly, happy, familiar faces that make me happy to be here and a bunch of scary strangers. <laughs> You know, I feel a lot more comfortable here now and I'm happy to say, look at all these smiles, look at all these, you know, people, aren't they all wonderful? And um, so just my grand finale, I wanted to say thank you so much for having this community and for welcoming me into it because it means so much to me to have people who I'm in a community with and friends who I feel closer to and people who smile when I come in. That's amazing for me. And yeah, thank you. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Michelle. That was simply wonderful. Learned so much. I'm sure um, 